Uh, hello, hello everyone. Welcome to our next six session of chapter five. Uh, today we are having Seyfullah Demirci as a guest speaker, and um, he is currently um, working as a mobile software engineer at Teladoc Health. But we know him from Jobhax project as well. So he is uh, also the alumni of e e I ITU. And today he's going to present us new trends in Android development in 2022. And this webinar is hosted by Guap. Guap is a community-driven open source accelerator. And uh, so let me introduce our agenda. So after short introduction, we will move on to the presentation part and we will have Q&A and wrap up session later. So today's session is also hosted by me. I'm Elvira Sirajdada. I'm currently doing my MBA at KAIST. Uh, I'm joining from Seoul, but I'm originally from Azerbaijan. And our, uh, the code of conduct for our webinars are, these webinars actually are for learning, benefiting, and contributing. We don't aim selling, uh, marketing, and competing. And we, um, we actually um, appreciate the equality here. So uh, thank you, Seifor, for accepting our invitation. And so we can move on the presentation part right now. All right, uh, let me start sharing my screen. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Seifor, by the way. And I will try to uh, present some uh, news about Android world, mobile world today. Uh, let me start my presentation. Uh, let me you a little like introduction first maybe uh, I'm from Turkey and I did my I did my bachelor's in back in Turkey in uh, computer engineering and I worked in the industry for like three years three and a half years back in Turkey and then moved to the United States for my master's and then I completed my master's with Sako here uh, and we did some cool stuff like job packs like like other projects in the school and I was part of that project as a Kind of like a backend engineer, or like you know, also like in the product side of things too. And I've been working as a mobile software engineer since I graduated from my graduated from my master's. And yeah, that's pretty much it. So let's get into the stuff. So I will start with some uh, platform updates. I'm gonna talk about Flutter uh, and some updates on Fuchsia OS, what's Fuchsia OS, what, and what's it's used for. I'm gonna talk about some Wear OS stuff, Google's uh, wearable device operating system. And I'll talk about some uh, new updates on the latest uh, Android operating system update, Android 12, that was released back in October, 2021. And I will go into some trends in the development side. I will talk about some de decentralized applications and that's impact on the mobile development. And I'll talk about the importance of Kotlin in Android world and some um, MEVM architectures and Jetpack libraries that are recommended and supported by Google. And these are the kind of like the trends or like the latest tech stacks or like the architectures that are being used in the industry. And I'll talk about some uh, Google Play features that have that's been like you know uh, being used in the industry for a while. And then. I'll I'll jump into some specific uh, technical details like Jetpack Compose, Kotlin co co Coroutines and Flows. These are gonna be uh, more technical stuff. So it's probably gonna be a little bit boring, but we'll see. Uh, let me start with platform updates. Uh, so I wanna start with Flutter. Uh, Flutter is a, is a UI framework that was developed by Google back in May, 2017. That was the initial version, and it was picked up by uh, like quite a few people because it was like free and open source. First of all, you know, open source always uh, brings some attention to the projects. And then this is some sort of framework where you can actually uh, code in one language in one code base, and you can have uh, native like cross-platform uh, output like iOS, Android, and web applications with using uh, one code base and one language. And recently, uh, last year in 2021 March, uh, they released a second version for Flutter. And after this version, 
it's pretty uh, stable and has the features that have that that uh, that's enough for you know like an MVP or like small size companies. And the language for Flutter is Dart. That's also some uh, open source project, uh, object oriented programming language with like a C style syntax. It's like C C plus plus, but it's like um, you know, it has some nuances in from uh, modern languages too. And this was also developed by Google back in 20, uh, 2011. Um, so they started with Dart. They released the Dart first as a language, and then they built this Flutter UI framework on top of. Uh, Dart as a as a mobile UI framework to be able to develop uh, hybrid iOS, Android, and web applications. So I'll just uh, play a quick video. Let me know if you can hear the sound of the video. Thank. Can you guys hear it? Actually, I can't hear. Uh, no. No. Just just give me a second. Sorry, I forgot to share my sound. I think to reach all your you. What do I know? Yes, now we can. Okay. In today's world, you need to build for many platforms to reach all your users while maintaining quality to keep them happy. Flutter enables you to ship an application for Android, iOS, and the web from a single code base. To do this, Flutter needs a programming language that works on all these platforms and gives you a fast development experience. That's why Flutter chose Dart. Let's take a look at how Dart enables you to develop a Flutter app quickly and deploy it to multiple platforms. If you're developing for mobile, you might be used to slow compile and debug cycles. Dart changes this by enabling one of Flutter's most loved features, Hot Reload, which injects updated Dart source code into your running app and rebuilds your UI in less than a second, so you can see your changes instantly. Also, today's users expect high quality experiences. Traditionally, you might have used separate teams to build performant apps for each platform. Dart enables you to build high fidelity Flutter apps for all platforms with one team. Dart's production quality compilers compile to ARM and x64 machine code for mobile or optimized JavaScript for the web enabling quick app startup times and smooth animations. Finally, Dart is easy to learn. You'll pick up Dart quickly if you're familiar with languages such as Java, Swift, and JavaScript. Together, Dart and Flutter help you create amazing experiences across Android, iOS, and the web. Try Dart in your browser today at dart.dev. Uh, that was a quick video about Dart. Uh, let's see. So. What are the advantages? Actually, these were mentioned in the video, but uh, let me go through them one more time. It's like, it's easy to learn and use because it's similar to Java, Swift, and React Native if you're familiar with mobile development or like, you know, any kind of development with Java or Swift uh, or even like JavaScript, picking up this language is pretty easy and it's a declarative language. So, uh, it's like pretty, and with the hot, hot reload functionality, you can uh, literally see your changes like in a second or so, and you don't have to worry about like build times or like having uh, strong machines to run some uh, IDEs. And this is actually something that would Sucker would probably be interested in. This is something that you can actually pick up if you're trying to uh, start a startup and uh, get some MVP done, especially in mobile world, because you can just, uh, uh, have one engineer that's familiar with this framework and you can just build one code base uh, with like the minimum amount of features to do an MVP and you can have web, mobile and uh, web and uh, iOS and Android applications in like really short amount of time. Uh, so this this is like the pretty good advantage of Flutter. Uh, and another thing is like, as I said, it's a single code base. So you have the, your business logic or any kind of logic in one code base. And whenever you want to add, new, add a new feature or change something, whenever, uh, once you're done with the change, it's applied to all your platforms, like uh, all, uh, on all the platforms. And, and uh, there's one more thing is like, it's clean and update documentation. It's like uh, better than Android actually, because uh, Google has been uh, trying to keep up with their documentation. But since Android is like 
uh, kind of older. And, you know, by the time they, they, they first released, they were trying to compete in the market too. They couldn't actually get a lot of documentation done, but with Flutter, they're trying to keep up with the uh, current latest changes with their documentation. So uh, the documentation and the uh, source code is pretty actually clean. And one of the reasons for that is this is an open source project. This is being contributed by like uh, hundreds of people uh, every day. So that also helps with the documentation and clean code. And uh, there's some uh, statistics here from uh, JetBrains. Flutter is the most popular cross-platform framework in the world. Uh, this was this was a survey that was done like last year. I think it's uh, actually pretty uh, impressive. Like in a few years, they picked up this uh, aim. So of course, uh, like advantages, it has its own disadvantages too. Uh, first of all, uh, first thing is being uh, the lack of engineers because it's like pretty new and the professional world is pretty tight for now. Uh, there are like not a lot of like job openings or job positions for uh, this particular uh, profession. But at the same time, this is like a chicken egg problem. There's always uh, this problem, but once the market picks up, then you're kind of late, right? So it's always uh, important to learn first and then, you know, uh, wait for the market to be there. And another thing is like, there, there are limited, limited set of libraries. This is something that's getting better, actually. There are like now uh, different supports for like in-app purchases, map support or like different hardware support. It's getting uh, there faster because as I said, there's like an open source community behind it. Uh, another thing is like it's there being even both Flutter and Dart is relatively new. So it's like tend to change the syntax, the, I, the way that it works tend to change. So you need to be able to adapt the changes pretty quickly. Uh, that's something that's common in like any kind of like new language or platform that's being released out there actually. And uh, Scalability is a concern. That's something that's, uh, there's not much companies that are uh, grown enough to prove that Flutter can be used in, a, in an environment that should scale. So that's like a, a bit of a concern, but I think that can be uh, proved sometime soon too, hopefully. So there was, there was Flutter and uh, I wanna talk about Fuchsia OS. Uh, so this is uh, Google's third operating system after Chrome OS and Unbraid actually. Uh, they recently uh, released their initial version in May, 2021. And uh, Fuchsia OS uh, written in C++, C, Dart and Rust and runs on Intel Air ARM processors. Instead of using Linux kernel, it's using uh, something called Zircon microkernel that's also built by Google. Uh, so it's different than uh, Android and uh, iOS 2 actually. It's not depending on the uh, Linux kernel. Uh, and then they actually released this initial version to their Google Nest Hub. So their first generation of Google Nest Hubs working on this new Pushy OS. And the application's user interfaces in the Nest, Nest Hub written in Flutter. So if you actually combine this push OS, Flutter and Dart together, this actually can be uh, replace the current market uh, with Android devices by Google because the whole uh, ecosystem of this from operating system to uh, application level, they own uh, the whole pipeline that makes it, it lets them to uh, have more control over the ecosystem. Now, if you imagine, uh, so let, let me actually continue with this. So the market that Android has in the world, uh, maybe we don't know because in the US, uh, Apple is more popular. Uh, there's not much like Android users, but if you look into the world, 70% like of the mobile uh, operating systems are owned by uh, Android powered devices. So it's like a huge market, but there are some disadvantages to Google for this because if you imagine there's like tens of different manufacturers and vendors that 
are producing phones and they're actually not using the uh, the stock version of the Android version, Android operating system, they actually customize it and ship their phones uh, with that customized Android version. Uh, this actually causes uh, some uh, stability issues on the Google side. Like let's say they actually released Android 12 back in October 2021, but since these those companies need to take that operating system, customize it and ship it with their phones, like it takes sometimes like months or years for Samsung, Huawei, or whatever that uh, manufacturer is to adopt that new version. So Google can't really update their push their updates to users' phones actually. So that's something that Google is trying to solve. And this combination of push OS, Flutter, and Dart can be uh, used as a solution to that because the whole pipeline and the ecosystem is going to be owned by Google. So I see, I pers well, this is a personal uh, opinion, but I see a pretty solid uh, future in terms of uh, mobile development in this environment. Uh, that's why I actually want to uh, talk about this stuff. Now I will go with the Wear OS. Uh, Wear OS is a lightweight Android operating system that Google is developing for their uh, Android powered wearable devices. They work with different manufacturers and vendors again. Uh, they work with, let's say, Samsung watches, fossil watches, and they put this Wear OS uh, operating system in those watches. Uh, Google also acquired Google uh, Fitbit. I think that was done also last year. And after after the acquisition, actually they are leaning on this wearable technology, and they're picking up the speed with like they're releasing their Jet, the newest latest Jetpack APIs to support Wear OS. They uh, they recently released Jetpack Compose support for Wear OS. Wear OS. Uh, they're having a new update called Wear OS 3.0. I think it's a, it's a major update after like a couple of years. And with this update, they're actually focusing on expanding this uh, in this market. As I said, like with bit, 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 bit acquisition. So this is something that's really uh, growing in the uh, Android side. Uh, yeah, I was gonna talk about the Android 12 news, but these are, you know, more technical details. They have some uh, some changes that are uh, kind of similar to I, what iOS has. They have they are trying to improve the privacy and the better life because like those are the things that is kind of lacking in terms of uh, in the market. Like they 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 can't really compete with the better life and uh, the privacy concerns now so they have like some sort of updates i'm not going to go over all of them actually i was going to but these are two technical details i can go back if we have time at the end uh but actually i can give this example actually this is a single line of code to apply a blur effect on a view right this is a new thing and you can apply that that blur effect with a single line of code now but until now, until like October 2021, to be able to do that, and which was not effective, by the way, it was like pretty memory consuming thing. You had to write like uh, like 100 lines of class to be able to apply a blur effect in Android. And in iOS, it was like one liner like this for like years now. And whenever you go into a room with a designer and with an iOS developer, and you're the Android developer, designer comes up with a blur and then like kind of iOS developer kind of like starts to giggle because it takes like maybe days for you to implement that blur thing in, a, in, a, in the same way that iOS does with a one-liner. So this is something that Google comes up now, but they're kind of like trying to catch up with these kind of like small details that are actually in the, you know, in the real world, when you, in, if you consider the real world, they're like really important, but yeah. Google is picking up right now. So this is like a small, small example that they have. This is also said the same, you know, iOS devices had always had this splash screen before they opened the application. And now under this bringing that as a 
as part of their user experience and like uh, consistency in their uh, designs. So I'll just quick skip. I have a link. I will share this uh, presentation by the way. But I have a full list of the changes and the improvements on Android 12. So if you guys are interested, you can actually check it there. Um, trends in Android development. So I will I'll talk about like more generic stuff here. Uh, well, I should maybe give like a disclaimer before that. Most of the stuff, most of the stuff here is gonna be like uh, my personal opinions in a sense. I know, like I, I I've been reading about these. I know, like there's some uh, demand in the industry about these, but like at the same time, this is uh, kind of like a personal opinion, especially for the decentralized apps. Uh, as you guys probably know, decentralized applications are getting more popular by the day. There are like different applications of blockchain right now like you know decentralized twitter decentralized uh cryptos cryptocurrencies they're all like uh, based on blockchains and of course if you think about like our daily life uh having those applications mobile application uh, web applications in your mobile device is inevitable so there's an there's going to be an industry that is going to be uh, raising uh, by by uh by day and uh, this is something that doesn't really adds a lot of complexity in terms of mobile development experiences, because the way that you actually develop your application is kind of the same. It's just how you interact with your backend, because in a decentralized world, you don't have a backend, right? You have either peer-to-peer -peer or like some sort of peer-to-peer -peer, uh, connection. So it's just that domain knowledge that you need to learn. And if you can pick that up, it's, I feel like, there's going to be uh, different uh, companies, like big companies that are uh, going to be implementing decentralized web mobile, web mobile and web applications for their products. Uh, like I've seen some, so I'm in the healthcare, uh, health tech industry now, uh, and I see some uh, issues with user privacy and uh, some uh, user PHI, patient uh, history information. So these are, if, you, if, if, if this can be combined with the centralized uh, applications, that, that's, that's like a promising industry, to, in, in my opinion. That's like one of the uh, examples that I can give. Okay, uh, the next thing is about Kotlin. Um, so, as you all know, Android started with Java, and they have been using Java as their uh, primary language for like years. And back in 2017, they announced their Kotlin, official support for Kotlin. Uh, and since then, they've been picking up on Kotlin. And now, even like if you go to uh, Google's documentation websites, the code, like little code snippets, you'll see in Kotlin, you can see the Java version, but the default is Kotlin. So they're really pushing uh, for, for us developers to learn and use Kotlin. And one of the examples is the Jet, Jetpack Compose that's, that was released last year too. Uh, this is only specific to Kotlin. You can't use this. Well, you can, you can export the UIs that you write in Compose and use it in Java, but you cannot compose new UIs using Java. So that means they're kind of slowly deprecating the support for their new uh, APIs and uh, frameworks. So I think that's that's something important to keep in mind uh, and move the Kotlin as much as possible. Because uh, as I mentioned here, even the questions and answers on the internet are being asked and answered in Kotlin now. If you're writing Java and if you're having some sort of trouble finding a solution to a problem, you go type some question and you get an answer in Kotlin that you cannot re possibly rewrite in Java and get it work in Java or like they're like three, four years old, outdated answers. So it gets hard to solve your problems too if you can't get, get them solved by yourself. And there are like some companies uh, written here that are, they're already, I don't think they all, all of their products are written in Kotlin at, at least not 100% because you can always, because you can always combine Java and Kotlin in application. But I think like, 
good amount of percentage of their application are written in Kotlin right now. These are like Netflix, Uber, Pinterest, and uh, so on. I think there's like more now. Um, so these are some facts about Kotlin. Uh, these are probably outdated, but uh, let's see. In three years, Kotlin is now used by 7.8% of the experts in the industry. And according to Sakura Flow, Kotlin is the fourth most beloved language in 2022 with 62.9% votes. That's like a really high percentage actually. And Kotlin is listed uh, as the in the top 20 programming languages by Redmond. Redmond is the, the kind of like big uh, company with these statistics. So now it's still in the top 20. I think it's like the 18th language now. Uh, and there's a multi-platform uh, support in Kotlin too. That's not something that's specific to Android. That's more like Kotlin, but um, it's possible to build cross-platform apps using Kotlin as well. Okay, this one is a little uh, more uh, technical or like specific to Android actually. Uh, MVVM architecture is an architecture that's not really specific to Android, but the usage of it with the Android Jetpack libraries is pretty uh, unique to Android. Uh, basically MVVM architecture is like M stands for model, <clears throat> Excuse me. VM is like model view model. So model represents your data and your data classes that you have like the information in and views are technically uh, basically uh, representing your UI and uh, your UI components. And your view model is the glue that actually glues the data and the UI together. So this actually gives you the power to apply the most important principle in programming, separation of concerns. When you separate your application in these three pieces where the user interface and user, uh, uh, your components are not coupled with your business logic and your data directly, then you can scale your app, you can improve the quality and robustness of your code base, and you can create testable apps. Because when you put everything together or like, you know, you don't decouple them, it gets really hard to test them because you need to mock or like take everything that happens at, at the point and then you try to test it. But if you divide it, uh, like I'll, man I'll mention this architecture, you can test them one by one and you don't really have to uh, mock everything to test only one uh, feature. So I'll mention the parts of this, like three parts of this architecture. Uh, the first part is the UI layer uh, that has the, uh, obviously the UI components that the actual like buttons, text, text, and like everything. And uh, this layer also has the view models that are uh, responsible to get the data from the data layer and use that data pass that data to the uh, user interfaces, to buttons, to texts, to show it on the uh, screen. And uh, yeah, so as I said, we have the uh, user interfaces and the view models to share the data. Um, usage, using, using these view models with Jetpack gives you uh, the ability to uh, retain your state of your uh, user interface, even though is like a recreation because in mobile world, let's say you have a screen with a bunch of information and like there's like some user input or like there's some check boxes and everything like a form. Uh, let's say you user is interacting with it, like checking some marks and uh, entering some text and everything. And then before they submit it, they actually put your application in the background and do some like they go to Instagram or Facebook or whatever they do, uh, they spend time. So what happens there is like the system, uh, whenever system needs more memory, it actually trims your uh, application in the background. So whenever, if the, the user decides to come back to your application, the, the information in the memory 
will be gone if you if you keep your state in uh, in your interface user interface level, you're going to lose that and you're going to be showing like an empty form or like everything that the user has done will be gone, which is a bad user experience, obviously. Uh, so these view models are specific to Android. These are special classes where you uh, where they retain themselves in a catch storage. So when you come back to the app, even though the the data on the memory is wiped, you can uh, the, it's automatically being uh, restored by the system. That's one of the advantages that is specific to Android. Uh, the next layer is a domain layer. This is kind of an optional layer uh, because this one has like is responsible to apply the actual business logic to the raw data that you're getting from an, I don't know, like a REST API or like from a service or from the local storage. This layer is responsible to apply that business logic to that. Um, this is optional because this is this becomes a necessity when your app grows a lot because you can technically put this business logic in your data layer where you get the data and apply your logic and pass it down to the UI layer. But as your application grows, your data layer grows too. And then it becomes something not manageable. It's become your data layer classes becomes thousand plus lines of code, which is not also manageable and testable and maintainable. So when basically when you see like a class of uh, class that has like more than thousand lines, then you, you'll notice that you need another layer of uh, business logic that you need to separate from the data layer. And when that's when the domain layer, layer is used. And the last is the data layer. So this is the, this is the part that, I, that is actually responsible to fetch your data from a REST API or a service or a you know, from a local storage. And this acts as a source of truth in the app. So the, this is the only part that is communicating with the data. So everything here, it needs to be in sync and uh, centralized so that you make sure that all the data that you're using, you're getting from here is uh, not stale and they're up to date. Um, that's why it can actually follow the singleton pattern. So that like, all the repositories are like a singleton of instances, but this is also not like this is something optional. It doesn't have to be, it depends on your uh, requirements in the project. Um, yeah, so what actually this gives, as I said, like gives you maintainability, testability, because when you um, have these layers, you can test your UI layer without uh, any, actual REST API calls because you can just mock that data and just test your actual uh, UI experience. Or like you can test your business logic just mocking your data and passing it to your demo domain layer. So that gives you the uh, power of testability. And another thing that can be applied is the modularization. This is also something that's being picked up by the Android community recently because uh, let me talk about it first. It's like a, it's not a new thing in the program world too, but this is something that wasn't being applied in mobile applications. So this is basically you divide your app into smaller pieces as modules and you ship them separately if you need to ship them separately and you maintain them separately. What this, what, what this helps uh, is like uh, to, obviously separate the uh, features. And then if you have like bigger size teams that are working on the same project, but in different features, they get less conflicts while uh, developing their features. Uh, and then there's, there's uh, faster building times, obviously, because you put your codes in specific modules, whenever you change something in a single module, that's the only thing that's been uh, rebuilt. So the rebuild times gets faster. And you can use uh, something called dynamic uh, feature delivery, which I'll talk uh, later. we we'll talk about later. Uh, so there are two different ways of uh, modularization that you can apply to your application. 
you can have something that's called feature modularization, where you keep your features in modules and everything that's related to your features, like your view models, your business logic, your uh, repositories, your data access into those modules that is specific to that features, that feature. So in that, in this sense, like you can have, like in, in this example, you can have a designer's news module as a feature and like a durable feature, and you can shift this based on the requirements. And another one is the layer modularization. This is something that's like, a, uh, that's not necessarily uh, related to like shipping based on the conditions. This is more like uh, bigger teams working on the same project kind of uh, modularization because you separate your user interfaces into one module. You have like all your, all your UI stuff and view models like your UI, UI layer in a module and you have your repositories, your data layer in a module and you have uh, your app in a module and you can have this um, system by uh, having them in uh, their corresponding modules so that uh, they can be maintained and developed separately. And this is called layer modularization. Uh, yeah, as I said, I mentioned this, like the advantages, you can plug and play, you can, let's say you have like a news app and you, you have the feed feature as a module so that you can actually build a new feed UI without actually changing the actual module, right? You can, you can create another one with a completely different UI, but you use the same components, data components, but you, you just develop a new one. So then whenever you're done, you can just replace them and you know just uh, update your feeds or you can do a b testing with those uh, different modules it's e it's easier to make a b testing uh, if you have them in separate modules and as i said you can leverage the google uh, play dynamic feature delivery so i have more resources here and the dynamic feature delivery is something that is uh, specific to Android too. So you can mark your modules as dynamic feature, which means it's they're not bundled in the in the output APK that you're actually uploading to the store where like your users download. So it's, it doesn't include your feature or module because they're marked as dynamic features, and you can uh, have them installed or downloaded to users based on some conditions, like let's say you're selling some premium uh, subscription or something for a feature, whenever that condition meets, you can actually uh, have that module or feature uh, being delivered to the user. Uh, and another thing that's really uh, getting more attention is the accessibility support. Um, accessibility support is being uh, an important topic for almost like every platform now. I remember getting uh, getting a, a PlayStation recently. And the first thing they show always are the accessibility things because uh, that's that's really important for the people that have, uh, that, that uh, who have special needs and all the apps needs to target like all the audiences regardless of their uh, needs. And there's like interesting thing that like 15% of the world's population has some sort of, some type of uh, disability. So that makes it really important. Uh, actually, I've been uh, working as a mobile software engineer for like more than five years now. And I wasn't aware of the importance of this before I started working for a health tech company. Uh, I honestly wasn't aware. And then obviously we need to comply with uh, some uh, standards like VCAG, which is a web content accessibility guideline, you know, to get like a certain level of points to be able to uh, consider it as a uh, health product. So obviously we need to comply to that. Uh, that's when I actually realized how important this accessibility is. And I would encourage everyone that is uh, working on mobile or like another you know, web application or uh, doesn't matter actually to uh, pay attention to the accessibility details. And it's really being supported by Google. They have been uh, providing 
different tools like they have an accessible to scanner application where you can actually run through your app, scan through your app, and they actually give you a, a report of everything you need to change, like color contrast. Like in this example, the one on the left is not actually uh, complying the con contrast rules. It's not that clear. Uh, or like the, your tapable areas, your clickable areas needs to be at least 48 pixels each side, like 48 pixel by 48 pixel, or you need to set content descriptions in the UI elements. These like these content descriptions are usually ignored by especially mobile developers because as I said, this is this was never like a first priority for developers, but this is something that's important because there are like screen readers for the people that need to use screen readers and when you don't provide the content description for a button that screen reader doesn't know how to actually announce that uh, action button or action uh, to the user so that's really important um okay next section okay i briefly talked about jetpack compose this is something that's really hyped actually last year uh, it's been released like recently, but it stayed in beta stage for for a good amount of time, and even in beta, people start to work, use it, work on it. Um, this is something that's uh, like a kind of like a breaking chains in Android world because uh, user interfaces are defined in XML files traditionally. So you have this XML file where you stack your user, uh, your components. Uh, you put like some layouts, buttons, text views in an XML file. And you come back to your class or like, you know, your Kotlin or Java class and you inflate that view. You then use the data you have to manipulate the views and you know show some, some views, hide some views based on the conditions or the state of data. But now with this compose uh, component, uh, it's being declarative, meaning you can actually declaratively define uh, your user interface in the same Kotlin or Java Kotlin. Actually, you can't really uh, create compose with Java. Um, you can create your UI in the same file while you're using the declarative API that is really uh, intuitive that I will show an example. Uh, just now, and you can actually find your uh, UI with using your data in this single point. So that really gives you to the uh, power of uh, writing your user, inter user interface in a very, uh, very efficient way, as opposed to having a separate XML file to define your uh, design and then bring it into a uh, uh, another class um, and this was this is backward compatible back to under 5.0 which is like which covers 90 percent of 98 percent of the all uh, android community so it's like if you're developing something in jetpack compose you're pretty much covering everyone that's using android phones so as i said it's, it's pretty intuitive uh, it's just a small example and the right one is the output of the code that's shown on the left. So in the in your class, the main activity is basically the, represents the screen here. And you basically create a message card class and you pass a message instance that has Android and Jetpack Compose as two parameters. And if, and if you see this part, this is the only piece of code you, to, that you need to build this uh, user interface on the right. So you basically have a row that has a, uh, eight pixels of padding from all sides. And in that you have an image that has like, you know, 40 pixels of size with a circle shape with some border. And then you have some space. And then you have some column that has a text and there's some space and some other text. So this is pretty uh, intuitive and like easy to use because I know like how it can be tricky to define this in an XML file, bring it to your uh, actual activity file. And if you see, go, on, go onto their websites and 
website and see their uh, roadmap for Compose. They're actually, which actually, they have this very well support as a roadmap item, but they actually like, delivered it like recently. So, which means like they're really putting some time in this. And uh, another point is the way that it's being declarative like this is the same way that you actually uh, implement your UI in Flutter using Dart. So that is like some sort of uh, similarities there, which actually kind of shows how they want to bring these two worlds together, like kind of like replace uh, the new Flutter world with this. Okay, um, this part is more technical, kind of, uh, because under it had some uh, bad history about running some uh, background tasks, like long running tasks, like hitting a REST API endpoint uh, or doing some heavy load work in the background thread because there was no native way to uh, do that. We, you had to use some sort of, uh, not some sort of, you had to use Java threads to do that. And the way that Java threads work is like you do, the manual work, you define your thread pools, you define a thread pool executor, and you provide the task to it, and you're responsible to cancel them, run them, make sure that they actually run successfully, or they, they had some uh, exceptions and stuff. These were all handled by the developer, and they were pretty error prone, because like, dealing with threads in java like thread level is not something that every mobile developer is familiar with and um having bugs in that kind of base environment is pretty uh, effective on the rest of the app so kotlin coroutines is solving this problem so they're they're uh, not also specific to uh, android this is specific to kotlin but combining this with the uh, Android lifecycle Jetpack components that Google provides is giving us the ability to not deal with this thread stuff and you just define define your operation as a IO operation and then you can just launch it in the scope of that view model like in the example here and then you don't need to worry about it. Whenever this view model is being cleared or destroyed from the memory, meaning that screen is gone, user went to another screen, then this, everything in that scope will be terminated too. So that's, that brings a lot of uh, simplicity to the mobile development uh, on the Android side. And um, these are heavily used in either Google's like latest uh, frameworks or you know, in the current industry. Excuse me. Um, Kotlin flows are also uh, built on coroutines. So this was, this is something that I was talking about. Like this is uh, something that's kind of specific to Android that's built on coroutines. So it's like similar to observer pattern in Java where like you observe to some, some uh, data source and whenever that data gets updated you get notified and uh, you kind of uh, start observing whenever you need to use that data and you start you stop observing when you're done with that data and this is something that's similar to that uh, but in this instead of observing and i think the correct term is collecting i think they call it uh, collecting instead of observing but that's pretty much the same thing. Uh, I have a little example here that I actually took from the Google uh, document. Uh, this is like a latest news example. So there's like a data source that fetches the actual latest news uh, from a data source like a REST API at a fixed interval. And I'll, I'll try to uh, show how that data is being passed back to the UI layer. So for that, as I said, we have a data source here. So like, there's like an API and we have like a flow that has a infinite while loop actually, which 
might seem like a little odd actually, but what it does is just fetches the latest news, emits that data, which means sends that data to its observers, collectors that are collecting this flow and delays this uh, operation for five seconds and does the same thing. So this is pretty much data source. The only uh, responsibility of this class is doing this, fetching the data, emitting that data to the uh, collectors and just laying it. And in the repository level, we uh, get this data, latest names data and map it with a filter that is applying this filter that's like, you know, it's just filtering the favorite topics of that news list to the specific to the user. And for each news, it's just saving it in the cache. So it's like a, you know, like a business logic where you have the bunch of news and you're just filtering it uh, into the topics that the current user has interested in, like favorited the topic. So this is just the business logic. So there's no actual data here. There's just a logic here. So the, the flow of data comes from the data source. It's being transformed here. And then in the UI layer, in the view model layer, in the view model scope, we launch this uh, favorite latest news flow and we collect it. So the end, the end data here is being, is being patched in the data source and transformed in the repository and passed down here as the favorite news because it's filtered in the repository. And now here we can actually interact with the user interface and use this data to show to the user the news list or whatever we are showing on the user interface. So that's pretty much how it works. Uh, and that's pretty much it actually. That's what I have. Oh, no. okay. First of all, thanks for the presentation. Um, uh, I have a few questions. Let's start from the last. Uh, you okay. talked you about. Can I can start? You guys hear me, yeah? Yeah. Yes. So, Several. My first question will be regarding if you look for the also using all these technologies for Android and iOS, do you see any point that they will no, I, they will be they kind of they will merge that you can decide for one and this will be yeah. Well, yeah. I mentioned Flutter. Uh, that is. That is something that's pretty close to what you're describing, like having one piece of single uh, source of code and you kind of uh, have an output of Android and iOS and whatever platform you have. I don't see a future that is uh, built on top of it. So I don't, I don't think there will be a technology where you actually have these things as an output in a native way. Because you know there's like React Native too, but it's pretty much JavaScript that's running on your like browser doesn't have the same feel as a native native application. So I don't think there will be a unified way to develop iOS and Android applications. But with this push OS, I believe maybe some new operating system or new devices can be used in different as different platforms in people's lives. So there can be a single operating system that is popular for everyone, I would say. So I, I don't think there will be a way where you can make things natively in both worlds. So, okay. the, so yeah, the short answer is no. Okay, it's gonna go parallel. I think what I'm was saying. Yeah, is it my turn? You can ask me a question, Ben. You want to live us? Or... Okay, I'll ask live. So, uh, okay, I did Android development until like 2018, I guess. Uh, 2018, well, 2017. 
Um, and we were starting to use Dart and Flutter, but I didn't like it too much because it reminded me of Cordova. Do you know Cordova? I never written it's Cordova. I've, I've, it's, I've, it's I've seen some. Terrible. It's stuff. terrible. <laughs> but, you know, I think Flutter is trying to do what Cordova was doing. The problem with Cordova is when the new Android version come out or the new iOS version comes out, it doesn't um, it doesn't keep up, you know. There's always a delay. The new OS, the new version comes out. Everybody wants to see their software running on the newest newest Android version or the newest iOS version because they have some new feature like multiple microphones or better video yeah. camera or something. And the problem is that Cordova just you know didn't support it. And we had I was doing speech stuff, so we always were dealing with microphones. It was just terrible. I couldn't use it. And I'm wondering, is, is Flutter doing a better job with, for example, microphone access or advanced camera features, you know, you know, things that, you know, when the new thing comes out, they want you to show off the new, you know, integrate the new yeah. camera or integrate. Is Flutter and Dart keeping up with that or are they always delaying a little bit? So yeah, I yeah I pretty much agree with everything that you just said, and even with like native implementations, yeah. you kind of can't really keep up with the operating system. They change like everything in a really fast fashion. Yeah, but so, they usually keep uh, up pretty quickly because like when Android, at least it was, when Android comes out with a new OS, and that OS supports some new features on some high end phones. Usually at that time it was Java, not Dart yet. Uh, the Java, there was always a Java API for it. You could get it right away in Java. Yeah. Uh, and I, I hope, well, okay. I guess Dart, Dart was always a little delayed, and I guess they're now supporting Kotlin, right, instead of Java. So does Kotlin get it right away, or who's the first one yeah. to get it? Who's the first one Kotlin. to be able to no. access the API? <laughs> Now is the Kotlin is the first one that's getting all the updates. As I mentioned, like even yeah. their, their new APIs are written in Kotlin and they're encouraging everyone to convert to Kotlin because like Jetpack Compose, they don't actually support Java anymore. Dart is a different well, story. Right. Dart, is, that, Dart is specific to Flutter. And then that brings another question is that let's say, and I'm sure you deal with this because I used to work in healthcare also and we always had the problem that Okay, you develop it for the new Android phones, but they're actually going to deploy it on a bunch of Android phones that are owned by the hospital. And those yeah. are older phones, right? So now you develop this new application and you realize you have to make it backward compatible with some old, old OSs. So I'm a little scared of Kotlin because maybe it can't support some old ones, or is that not true? No, it's not the case anymore. Yeah. Uh, okay. No, yeah, with the Kotlin, it's not definitely, and even yeah. with the new features or APIs that are pro that they are providing, again, Jet Jetpack Compose is backwards compatible back to Android five point zero, which covers ninety eight percent. That's pretty much cover like a lot. Okay. So it's so like I, I, guess... I I've never seen like a concern like that recently, but yeah, th th there have been concerns like back in. 2015, 16, yeah, yeah. on that timeline. Yeah. yeah, and then the problem that you had then is that, I guess with Android Studio, you can tell it how far back you want to support, right? And it'll insert yeah. some extra library code to, to, to make a wrapper around those features that weren't available in the Android API before. And yeah. with Java, you could do that. Uh, and I remember when iOS, and iOS, when they switched over to Swift, right? That was a a uh, potential problem for a while. A lot of people were continuing to write code in Objective C because yeah. if you want to support an old iPhone, you know, Swift couldn't do it. And I don't know what the situation is right there right now, but for Android, I guess Kotlin is able to support some old version. Then that's pretty yeah. good. Yeah. I think both platforms are deprecated those versions who that are that were not compatible with Objective C or, you know, not supporting code right. things yeah right yeah. yeah so now like it's pretty backward compatible like as i said almost like 100 percent of the devices that you can reach to with using swift and Kotlin now 
Yeah, but so as I said, dark, dark and flooded is a different story. Like when your company deploys something to like a hospital, right? And the hospital may have a bunch of old Android phones, you know. They're, yeah, they're not that old anymore. That's the actually good part of it. So yeah. They're moving faster now. Yeah. That was always a problem but, with iOS. They didn't want to buy the newer iPhones. They used their old iPhones. The doctor get the new iPhone and then they give the old iPhone to the hospital. So the hospital had a bunch of these iPhone 4s and 5s, you know. <laughs> And stuff yeah. wouldn't run on them and uh yeah. but for dart and flutter uh so first of all android studio does support flutter and dart so you can actually do your development in android studio and it's officially supported so they actually get updates regularly but in terms of apis and you know the new features mm. i would say it's still good in terms of speed, but essentially it's a it's a, a multi-platform plat, uh, platform framework, right? It is, it needs to support iOS features too. I would say iOS features are coming really slow. That's yeah, one of yeah, the yeah one of them. That's one of the things slower than the other. Yeah. 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 That's why actually no like big companies are picking up on this for their products because. We don't know the scalability of this yet. Yeah. But for like startups or like early stage companies that are trying to build their MVPs or like, you know, they're trying to throw something that's working for now right. until they and get the really opportunity good. to, yeah, it's like fast and reliable and, you know, and the, you know, since it's like a UI um, yeah. framework, it makes some things easier, like, some animation, adding some animations, having some sort of material so does design. It kind of Kotlin, does it produce Kotlin code? Does does Flutter produce Kotlin code? Then you can later later maintain the Kotlin code. Then uh, it does produce something in between. I I don't want to say it purely generates Kotlin code where you can maintain it if you wanted to, uh, which I'm not hundred percent sure too. I don't want to yeah. uh, be wrong in that, but actually produces uh, the components in a native way as much as possible. Oh, it's okay. like, a, oh, actually it's kind of uh, like, it is, it needs only a canvas to draw things on it. So it's like, oh. it's like just drawing stuff on a canvas. It's like a, from a single point. So it's like okay. that part, that single point of en entry is kind of like a native entrance mm. but like on the, the things on the dart or further side is like not native or like not caught in or uh, swift at all okay i think or orkan wanted to say something sorry i talked sako knows me i can talk a long time if you right. don't tell me you did great <laughs> That's what we need. okay orkan go ahead oh i uh, i said you can continue if you want <laughs> Uh, my, my question is about Kotlin flows. Uh, is it a kind of replacement for, um, like, is it kind of implementation of reactive programming? I think in Java, there was uh, Rx Java. Yes. And uh, what's the difference and the similarities? Like, can this uh, completely replace Rx Java? Yeah, so the, actually Rx Java was uh, following the observer pattern. Uh, so as you said, it's like the, uh, they have the observer pattern where you had the, the data sources or like the, the producers where you can observe their uh, data. And yes, actually, this is pretty much coroutines and flows together, actually, are replacing Alex Java and uh, all the functionalities they have. Uh, other than that, actually, of course, coroutines and flows have some more advantages. One of the things that comes to my mind is, uh, so for Rx Java, I think you had to create new threads. So you still had to define thread pools. Like you didn't have to define thread pools, but you had to tell Rx Java to have like 10 threads, 15 threads to work with. With coroutines, uh, it's, it has something called suspension, where suspend you can mark a function or a, a yeah, function as a suspend function that can 
uh, like several suspend functions can run on a single thread. So you don't have to create a thread to run another uh, long running uh, task, which, you know, creating a thread and like killing it is like a lot of uh, resource co consuming problem. So with the suspend functions, you can actually have several uh, long running tasks that are distinct, but you can run them in uh, a single thread. So that's one of the things that I believe did not exist in RX Java and Java world. Uh, and it, it's like a supported default feature, in the core routines. Okay. And actually on top of this, uh, now they have something that's called state flow. Um, that's also built on top of uh, Kotlin flows, but that's also specific to Android. And that's replacing live data, if you're familiar with it. They have live data. Yeah, that's a part of uh, Jetpack library too. It's pretty much like, you know, when you have a variable that has some sort of information, let's say it, it keeps a name of the user, right? And uh, whenever that variable changes, you don't really get notified if, you, if it's just a regular variable, right? And like that is something that's kind of like, kind of like an observable that actually follows the observe, observe pattern too, but that's not Rx Java. It's like the uh, part of the Jetpack library. So it's like something that you can observe too, but it's like a text. It's like a string or like an integer. But whenever it does change, you get notified. Yeah. So I got that, yeah, that was that was the old thing that they were using. But the limitation with that was it needed to run on uh, the main thread, UI thread. There was some limitation on that. That's why they came up with this state flow uh, where you can actually run these on a IO core routine where you can uh, run them and process them and then you can just uh, pass them to the UI without bothering the main thread. Okay, thanks for your answer. Thank you. I have one more question, Seifa. As a DevOps engineer, curious, how it's look like for CI CD when you're developing for Android application? Like, is it like normal as a application and what are the tooling? Uh, well, I'm not really familiar with, uh, well, I actually, I don't even know if there's like specific CI CD products for mobile. Uh, Good stuff by the Well, I don't even know if there's a need for that because I know Jenkins can do it, and Jenkins is a pretty old uh, system that's kind of like still being used. We use it, and it works. Well, I mean, it sometimes needs some pushes, but it still works. And I don't even know if there's a need for CI CD systems that's specific to mobile development. So, but I, what I mean is like whatever you're using right now. For your CI CD for your web applications or uh, you know however applications you have would be fine for mobile development. So I don't think there's a need for it. Just to yeah go over so developers ship the code to GitHub and then it's passing the unit test before merging the PR yeah let's say yeah and once it's merged the the unit test from Jenkins for example and every client, it's just packaging and then they would ship. Is it deployed or anything else like integration? Um, yeah. So as far as shipping it by a script goes, uh, I don't have enough familiarities with it the parts that we all, always had was to the point where you have your pipeline where it starts with the commit and then it runs the unit tests or like integration tests and whenever they pass you can merge it into your branch and the release part was well i know some companies do that but i was never part of a company that 
had that kind of um, CICDs. So uh, I'm not sure what the answer is for that. So I'm not familiar with those uh, technologies. That's what I'm trying to say, basically. I, I have I have one question, it's a little different from this, but is Android Studio still? I know when I started Android development, people were using Eclipse. Then yeah. Android Studio Dark came times. out, and it was yeah, <laughs> it was so buggy, it was terrible. And then it seemed Android Studio was the one, and now I think people, some people, are using VS Code to do Android development. But isn't Android Studio still the one? that's like recommended and best support yeah it is as long as you have a 2500 plus k i mean 2500 plus computer yeah really. i know it takes a lot but yeah but yeah as long as you have a strong computer it's it's like it's like uh i've been using X, xcode do i've been doing some of development recently and yeah uh i see that it's getting closer to that kind of like simple and easy usage kind Android of like Studio, X you yes yeah oh. it's, okay. it's like getting there and I, actually I don't, well they always clone each other right and whenever yes. some one of them comes with a you know nice feature that's being used by the developers they clone yeah. it so i see that okay. too actually they're, they're they're making pretty good progress actually but anyway, at least it's stable. It doesn't like crash during it compiling is. and no. stuff like that. Yeah. Okay. And no. Google supports it well, right? Yeah. Google yeah. is like, you know, fully supporting under Studio. And it's like, um, like they release um, really uh, specific stuff for under Studio. Like, yeah. That's what I mean. Like, yeah. Yeah. Like prof profilizers like network yeah, yeah, yeah. usage usage like yeah. or your you can you can uh, right because it's a real pain like, um, when i started i was using eclipse and then i was supposed to go to android studio but i kind of didn't want to because i had everything in eclipse and you know it really got to be really difficult to continue in eclipse because you know you know i'd ask a question on a forum and they say the answer is that use android studio not eclipse sorry goodbye and you know <laughs> yeah that's the same thing happening with java right now well that's why i you, appreciated you said that i thought i was thinking that might be happening and i i kind of know the background because when i was doing the android stuff i was actually at oracle and you know the reason that google is dropping java is because oracle sued them yeah <laughs> and i was in the middle of that like oh let's see oracle says this and google says that <laughs> and wait a minute oh i don't know what i'm supposed to do and that is why I was using Eclipse because they wouldn't let me use Android Studio on a company-owned laptop. It was a, it was against the company rule, so you stuck. You know, I had to use Cordova. I had to use Eclipse. It was terrible. <laughs> yeah, company I would rule. say it's 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 a lot better now. It's like oh yeah, yeah I would really, yeah. I would really want to start uh, learning mobile development without that knowledge of that dark times. Well, yeah. actually, it helps too. Sometimes well, I, no, Eclipse I really was good for a while. It it was it was before Android Studio was out. Eclipse was good, and then they basically kind of stopped it and broke it and never fixed it. And well, that's what happens, you know. You you yeah. get a new iPhone, it's good for a few years, and then whenever the new one comes out, your old one starts getting slower and slower. For some reason. Well, yeah, but it's not so much slower. I mean, okay, then, you know, if, if there's an app that's going to break it, it just won't update the app. The problem is with, uh, with the development environment. So that's what I worry about VS Code, although it seems to be yeah. used quite a bit. I'm using it now for most of my stuff, but, um, you know, I don't think I want to use VS Code for Android development, not because VS Code is bad, but I'm just really afraid that Google's going to put out something that breaks it so that it won't work right. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah, I would say under Studio is definitely the way to go for it. Yeah. Well, that's why I appreciate it in your talk. You talked about what is popular and what is actually being used because everybody claims everything, their development environment is best, but you really have to know what people are actually using 
Because, for example, I think WebOS is a really great mobile operating system. I think WebOS is great. Nobody uses it, but I think it's great. <laughs> right. <laughs> Maybe you don't remember it. I think it died in 2009. <laughs> well, yeah, I briefly remember it, but I, 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 I didn't HP really. Bought it. When HP program. bought it, that was the end of it. Uh, that good operating oh yeah system. that's good. yeah well that's why I, I forgot to mention that um yeah it's good with flutter dart like push os like or whatever they're doing but um there's one thing that i always remember uh at least like remind myself when i talk about google's products yeah they really tend to kill stuff like they right do. away yeah so it's yeah. like yeah but i mean they wouldn't kill Android because like really old and, you know, like I, I shared the market market share for it. Oh, but yeah, yeah. For this kind of stuff, it's always good to be, you know, like keep an eye on it, learn a little bit about it. Maybe do yeah, some but that's side always, projects. That's but... always a balance because it's hard to maintain old stuff, right? You know, it's a lot yeah. of work. I know people at Apple, I know many people at Apple whose whole job it is, is to make sure that apps that Apple puts out still work on old operating system. It's really kind of a boring job because they got to use the old technology. Hey, there's this new feature, but you can't use it because your camera doesn't support that or you only have one microphone or, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's not the sexy part of Apple to work in. <laughs> no. Yeah, but they have to, you know, to some extent. I think they're better at supporting their old things than Android is, but whatever yeah but you're right google is famous for just you know tomorrow that ui is dead sorry yeah <laughs> yeah okay. yeah uh, i have a little low level question uh, I, I, I was in another call. I don't know if anyone asked or asked or answered this question. Uh, my question about uh, Flutter and native apps. In uh, when you're building a mobile application with React Native, uh, what they are doing, I believe, uh, in the app there is a JavaScript engine, and it uh, runs JavaScript inside the Android application. Uh, so it's not efficient. Uh, so you, you can feel the difference between native and uh, React native. And, and yeah. I want to understand uh, how does Flutter work in low level? Uh, and also one more question. Um, a few years ago, I heard that, for example, when you're building APKs with Flutter, it has more APK size than native applications. Uh, and uh, yeah, I just want to understand how, what does happen to this code and what's the difference between native and Flutter in low level? So, uh, well, this is something that I'm not 100% uh, sure. Well, at least I don't know like the, the, all the details about it, but what I know is Flutter is not uh, converting it to like 100% native code. So what it does is um, it, it like, I think we can think about it, like imagine launching an activity in an, an Android and it kind of uses that single entry point, that activity, that canvas, that view on the activity to draw on. So basically it's like drawing uh, your UI that you're uh, declaratively writing in the dark side, in the further side, it's just uh, rendering that those on that single screen. That's why it's like, it doesn't feel like it's like JavaScript, you know, it still kind of feels like uh, native, but at the same time, you can still tell the difference. But uh, as far as your question goes, I actually don't know the full answer, like, the, uh, to answer it like in um, detail of how that works. And for APK size, I think the reason that uh, that's that's larger size is that they have the those uh, the builders and the interfaces where they actually uh, have the like uh, those 
I would say like those uh, convert, well, I, I don't know the term for it, but those like stuff that actually converts that dark uh, UI uh, methods into uh, the actual uh, code. I think that that's what make uh, the APK sizes bigger. And I actually know, well, I actually read uh, a lot about it that Google is uh, working on it. Like uh, I think they're working uh, more than they work on the actual features that they did. They're trying to decrease the size of the uh, PK because that's what I what they've been doing uh, with Android. Actually, they're encouraging people to use app bundles instead of APKs. Uh, they're encouraging to use dynamic features delivery, so they're trying to reduce uh, the size of uh, the bundles that are be being uh, Released on the Play Store, but as I said, I, I don't really have like a honestly, I don't have like a hundred percent correct answer to that. But I can actually. That's, that's a good question. Actually, thank you. I will probably look into that. I will probably share. Uh, I'm. I, are you on Slack? You're on Slack. Right? Yes, I'll I'm probably. You can share in community. Yeah, yeah. I'll 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 read about it. Actually, that's a that's a good call, uh, and I will share what I find. Yeah, thank, thank you for. A question. I have one more question, Sefa. So, for being this again coming from DevOps world, Google Cloud, Amazon, and all these guys, which one is more mobile development friendly? Is there any preference? Uh, I think the answer is Google for that question because they have. Well, I mean, they have Firebase that can be integrated directly uh, to the Android applications, and you can actually use their SDKs and APIs to in, uh, implement in iOS too. And Firebase kind of like gives you an interface to access to the databases and services on uh, on the cloud. You can literally use some credentials to access to your database and like write some data there and you can use some some noise school uh data patching there but um i might be biased for this so i don't want to say like google is probably the most compatible but as far as the technologies i know uh i think firebase is uh, the one that's really easy to implement in the mobile world um, but that, as I said, uh, I might be biased because I know more Google products than I do for AWS or Azure. Maybe they have similar technologies too. So more Firebase that is not similar technology. Well, yeah, that's why I don't want to say there's no other one because I don't know, but uh, I can tell the name of Firebase is uh, better now, at least. If there's like different products that lives in AWS or Azure, I could probably say like they're not as known as Firebase, at least in the Android world. And actually, that's not something that's really uh, being used in mobile world. Too. There's no one-to-one -one interaction in the cloud world when you're developing uh, an application, there is still, well, if it's not a decentralized app, of course, there's always a middleware. Like uh, it's still not a not an accepted uh, architecture or like a solution for mobile applications to interact with the uh, cloud services like that. There's, uh, I mean, yeah. There's, it's still it's still the norm that there's always a middleware between the services and the mobile applications, like some sort of API. GRPC is pretty actually, well, actually, I didn't really mention about GRPC. GRPC is being picked up by a mobile application development oh, too. HTC. Yeah, well, I, I'm not sure about HTTP3, but uh, like REST is kind of dying, I guess. GRPC is, well, I don't know the reason actually why. GraphQL, as well. GraphQL is, has been, yeah, people use 
GraphQL extensively too, but REST is definitely dying. And gRPC. Flexibility at all? Yeah, that too. And for gRPC, I think the reason is that the, the, the I think the performance and the scalability of gRPC services are pretty good. Um, REST always had its uh, restrictions and stateless nature. Yeah, but yeah, of course that that's a great call too. GraphQL is also something that's uh, that's been around for for uh, for a while. GRPC is like kind of like a neighbor thing. GraphQL, it's, it's, it's like an old thing, but yeah, it's being used in mobile too. But yeah, the point is like REST is dying, that's for sure. REST, REST is not the way that people or the companies go these days. So one more question would be regarding making money with these Android apps. I had a friend couple also like making it work and now his ads and so on, but I assume his timing is coming harder and harder. Is it still the case or any other? Uh, well, I mean, I think there's always money if you have a unique idea, but it's really hard to keep up uh with the industry if you're not if you're like focused on like making money out of ads and clicks and stuff you cannot still do that because as i showed like market is too big like 70 percent of the whole mobile usage of the world relies on uh android and it's well I, the reason that i'm talking about android because you can't really get those apps that are like kind of like clickbait apps to uh, that are specific to make money are not being approved by Apple because they have an extensive level of review process for their applications. And in Android world or like in Google world, that's not the case. You can actually get your apps approved and published on the Play Store fairly easily. That's why I'm talking about Android, but that's still the case, but it's just like a one shot thing where you can you know, make some money out of it, but there's no sustainability into that. I don't think at least. Guys, more questions? Maybe a question about job. Uh, suppose that I want to find a job as fast as possible, uh, let's say in the US or in the uh, Europe, uh, which technology, like uh, should I go with native or flutter? Um, if you don't have an experience and if you want to get in the mobile, uh, I would say don't go with Flutter because as I mentioned, it's not, there's like not enough uh, market <clears throat> for Flutter engineers. And uh, I think the focus would be, <clears throat> I would say be an iOS developer actually. That's always uh, something missing in the industry because uh, iOS and iOS development is like unique to, you know, like you need to have a MacBook device to be able to uh, make iOS applications, right? You need to buy a developer account that's like hundred something dollars yearly. So that's like a, you know, like a, it has its own like little uh, area of things. So it's like, it's always, there's, there's a, there, yeah, there, well, yeah, yeah, pretty much. And uh, that's why there's always less iOS developers. And if you have the chance, that's probably the way to go. Doesn't matter if you're in the US or in another country, there's always less iOS developers, that's for sure. And the way that Apple is uh, functioning shows that it's not going away anytime soon. And there's always gonna be native development for iOS. 
So that's that would be the way to go. If I if I were to start mobile development today with a fresh mind, I would probably start with iOS, which actually I'm also getting into. I've been doing some iOS stuff for myself too. Uh, if not, then uh, yeah, I would definitely say start with uh, native native development. But if you're gonna go into Android, then definitely not look into Java stuff. Like start with a fresh mind with uh, the latest recommended way of doing things. Kotlin, coroutines, flows, and everything. And good thing, like uh, Ben probably remembers, like there was almost like little to no documentation back then, like in 2014, 15, you were to go into sports code most of the time to figure out things, how things work, if you have a problem. But now they're, they're like, the documentation they have is like pretty good actually. And they keep updating it constantly. And they have the- yeah, I agree. The, Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I agree with you. And because uh, actually, so I'll tell you <clears throat> something that happened to me in, uh, I think it was 2012. Um, I was working at Oracle and I really quickly got an app running on Android, like after just a few weeks and they were really impressed and they said, Hey, but it's got to run on iOS. So come back in two weeks and show me. And I'd never touched Xcode before. I, I didn't know, I hardly know how to use Mac iOS or anything. And, um, yeah, I had a two week deadline to rewrite native code in in objective c it was miserable it was hard but you know the top managers didn't know that they just thought i could push a button and it translates java to, to objective c you know I'm like no <laughs> yeah but it was it was really you know it's interesting to see like ios when you look at the forums and so on it's really full of professional developers android is more full of like high school kids, <laughs> I shouldn't say that, but it's it's um, it's much more serious. The whole iOS community is just more serious, you know. And if you ask something on there, you'll get sometimes you'll just get a pointer to the documentation which you should have known of, known of, you know, you should have known about. You know, don't you know this? Yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> and on the, on the Android side, you get like two sentences with that with that yeah. not work not working yeah right. <laughs> exa exa example code like th this works right. this way oh try this yeah it broke something else yeah. <laughs> <laughs> i think we can conclude oh, thank you very much Sipa. yeah Representation. So I will I will shortly share your contacts. Uh, just a minute. Yes, I'm sharing my screen. I'd like to share your contacts to the one the participants and the one who will uh, watch the recording okay. later. <laughs> so thank you very much, Sefo, for. Presentation and thank you for everyone for this fruitful discussion. And um, anyway, I'm like I'm the one with less technology in this room, but I enjoyed a lot. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Thank you, everyone. 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 Thank you, everyone.